Indeed, this is the day we rejoice. Our church is going to witness one of the most sacred and defining moments in a person's life and the life of our church. Candidates, congratulations to each one of you for your accomplishment of the process that brought you here. It has been a long journey for you to come to this place, but we know that it is God's grace that brought you here. We also know that you are here not by yourselves. You came to this moment and place of your life because there are people who believed in you, prayed for you, nurtured you, and have taken the journey with you. I would like to extend my congratulations to the families of the candidates. Your prayers, support, encouragement, love, and care for them have made a difference along the way. I also want to thank the church Many played a vital role in nurturing the candidates and in the discernment and decision-making process on their call on ministry. Thanks be to God for your ministry among us. Candidates, it is my highest honor and privilege to be the bishop of your commissioning, recognition, and ordination. I would like to share a brief message which I hope and pray will add a blessing to your journey ahead. Three points. First, we confirm and celebrate that you are taken by God. In his book titled, The Life, the Life of the Beloved, Beloved, Henry Nouwen connects the significance of our life in Christ to the sacramental liturgy of the Last Supper. Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take it, this is my body. As bread is taken by Jesus, you are taken by God. The most amazing thing about it is this. God knows everything about you, and still you are taken by God. <laughs> it's the most amazing truth of God's love, isn't it? God loves everything about us, top to bottom, inside and out. Still, God loves us. It's not that you took Jesus, but it's Jesus who took you. It's not that you chose Jesus, but it's Jesus who chose you. That's what the calling is about, isn't it? It's not that you called Jesus, but it's Jesus who called you. Whenever I'm reminded of Jesus' words in John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. My sense of calling is renewed. Calling is not about me. It's really about the one who called you. Your life and ministry as clergy, particularly as a pastor, is demanding. Sacrificial, self-giving, and servant leadership is expected and required. Interruptions in your personal life and in the life of your family occur regularly. Some serious conflicts may erupt. There will be times of ups and downs in the journey of your life and ministry as a servant of God. Now, I'm going to tell you a humorous story. You may have already heard about it, but when I say laugh, you laugh anyway. <laughs> Jimmy, it's time to go to school, shouts the mother from downstairs. But there was no response. The mommy shouted again, Jimmy, it's time to get up to go to school. But still no response. So finally she went upstairs and opened the bedroom door and said, Jimmy, it's time to get up. If not, you'll be late for school. And Jimmy answered that, I don't want to go to school. All teachers hate me. All students hate me. Nobody likes me. Please tell me why I should go to school. The mother said, I have two good reasons. First, you are 42 years old, <laughs> and you are the principal. <laughs> we all days like Jimmy. 
However, your sense of calling makes all the difference. You are in ministry for no other reason but the one who called you. As long as you keep the sense of calling clear, strong, fresh, you will have joy and fulfillment even in the midst of tough times. God's people, please honor the God who called your pastor. Pastors are not hirelings. They are there because of the one who called them and the church that sent them. Our pastors need all the prayers and encouragement and support that they can get to be as faithful and fruitful as they can be for the task given by the one who called them. Candidates, I want to remind you that the one who called you and took you has the power to give everything that you need to fulfill the call you have received as long as you make sure that your ministry is about Jesus Christ, who called you by his own glory and goodness. Second, you are the blessed one. When Jesus blesses the bread, it is sanctified and is now used as a sacred vessel for Christ's presence. Like the bread taken and blessed by Jesus, you are a sanctified vessel for God's purpose. God who called and blessed you now puts Christ church to your trust. It's a sacred trust that you must uphold for the rest of your life. A couple of years ago, I was with Bishop Robert Rimba at the Metropolitan Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church for the ordination service, their ordination service, by his invitation. I was standing next to Bishop Rimba when the candidates for ordination made the covenantal vows by answering the questions that the bishop asked of them. When we asked each question, the candidates answered it individually, one by one. There were several questions to be asked and to be answered. In the middle of this time of questions and answers, there was a pause. It was a long pause in silence. I wondered what, was, what it was about. I slightly turned my head and looked at the face of Bishop Rimbo to figure out, to figure it out what was going on. I found him weeping. That was the reason for the pause. In a cracking voice, he said to his candidates, my brothers and sisters, do not betray the sacred trust that Christ and his church entrusted upon you. Candidates, your bishop asks the same thing. Our church asks you the same thing. The Christ Jesus who called you and blessed you asks you the same. As God's sanctified vessel, we carry the sacred trust. When it is broken, the body of Christ is broken. It breaks the heart of God more than anyone else's. In today's reading of the epistle, Peter charges God's people to escape corruption in the world caused by evil desires and to participate in the divine nature by adding to faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual kindness, and love. Peter makes it clear that these qualities of the divine nature do not come naturally with a position or with a moment of consecration. He says, make every effort to possess them in increasing measure. That's what the spiritual discipline and sanctification that Wesley taught us about, isn't it? 
We are on the journey to be more like Christ by participating in the divine nature. This inner journey is the greatest journey of all. Let's be reminded of the charge that the Apostle Paul makes for God's servants. I urge you to live a life worthy. To live a life worthy. To live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Candidates, there's no other way for you to live up to this charge by honoring the sacred trust that Christ Church entrusted upon you in all places at all times till the end. Third, you are blessed to be a blessing. Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, take it, this is my body. The bread which was blessed was to be given. The blessed bread is now a life-giving gift to the world. As God's chosen people, we have a significant connection to God's calling of Abraham. He was the father of our faith. God made it clear what Abraham was called for, to be blessed so that he could be a blessing to the world. We are living in a world where confusion is common as it relates to one's purpose in life. I'm sure that all of us at one point in our journey were in places where we were not quite certain of what was God's plan and purpose for our lives but we cannot stay confused about it too long. Let me tell you a story. When I said laugh, laugh. <laughs> if you visit Seoul, the capital city of Korea, you'll find that there are so many apartments all over the places. It's a very small land, but there is no other way to build but going up. <laughs> Some apartments like a 20, 30 high buildings, it's all over the places. Many apartment high tall buildings in one complex. And one person uh, had to pick up from his apartment, so had to come back from his work and parked his car in the parking lot and got out of the car and came to the entrance of his apartment and found out that power was out temporarily. So the elevator was not in service. He's living on the top floor, 20th floor there. It's a very hot, humid summer day, but he had no choice. So he had to walk up all the way 20 stories, all the steps up. And in front of his apartment door, he collapsed. <laughs> Do you know why? He realized that he didn't have a key. So he had to come down all the way <laughs> to his car. And he collapsed again. Do you know why? He realized that he did have a key in his inside pocket. <laughs> so he had to go up all the way up to the top floor, 20th floor. And in front of the door, he collapsed again. Do you know why? The door was unlocked. <laughs> so he went in and he collapsed again. Do you know why? It was a wrong apartment. <laughs> now you laugh. This is a story of a very confused and disoriented man. <laughs> like this person, there are people who do not know where they are and what they are looking for. Suddenly, some people find themselves in a wrong apartment at the end of their journey. People are looking for a blessed life, a purposeful life. For a purposeful life, these elements must be present, a sense of identity to claim, a sense of obligation to serve, and a sense of destiny to fulfill. All these elements are powerfully present in the story of Abraham's calling. 
The story includes the promise of God's blessing and the demand on an obligation to be a blessing. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. It also includes a proclamation of the destiny of the chosen. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. As God's people, we are the blessed ones. That's our identity. Claim the identity. Our blessedness is meant to be a blessing. That's our obligation. Serve this obligation. God's blessings will continue to flow through us until all the peoples on earth will be blessed through us. That's our destiny. Fulfill this destiny. That's what a purposeful life is about. That's what an abundant life is about. That's what a blessed life is about that people are searching for. God's people, let the world know that we have what they are looking for. God's people, we have it. There was a man crippled from birth. When he saw Peter and John going into the temple courts, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as he did John. Then Peter said, look at us. Silver or gold I do not have. But what I have, I give you. What I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And you know the rest of the story. God's people, we have it. The life-changing power that Peter is talking about. We are not the life-changing power. But Jesus is. We have the name of Jesus, the most powerful name on earth. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ, the life-changing power of God. We have Jesus. We are, not, we are not the story, but we have a story to tell. We are not the song, but we have a song to sing. We are not the message, but we have a message to give. Indeed, we have a Savior to show to the world. God's people... We have what the world is looking for. Let's stop behaving as if we don't have it. Let's stop acting like we are ashamed of the gospel. We know that it's the power of salvation. Let's not shy away proclaiming this gospel, the power of salvation of God. Jesus said, I came to give you life an abundant life, my interpretation. You have it, an abundant life. Live it now. Candidates, you are taken and blessed by God to be a blessing. It is the most blessed life you can ever have. Let's remember, every blessing comes from God. We receive it freely, freely received, freely give. Let me end with a slightly revised version of the famous words of John Wesley. My beloved, taken and blessed by God, to all the people you can, by all means you can, in all the ways you can, in all places you can, at all times you can, as long as ever you can, in the name of Jesus Christ, be a blessing. Best way. You can. In the name of Jesus Christ, let the church say amen.